Druids are a very unique brand of control caster. They can set up the control spells like a web. Well, actually, druids not, are not web, ones, which is stupid. Criminal. One of them yes. does. Uh, the 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 one of the land sub subclasses gets web, but okay. Uh, you can set up you know spells like moonbeam and things like that to do area control, and those are great to cast early in combat as well. Better than those though is summoning spells. It is best, the best time to cast a summoning spell like Conjure Animals is immediately. Hello, friends. Robert Bevan here, author of the Caverns and Creatures series of comedy fantasy novels and short stories. With me is Cameron, aka Prince Phantom. And today we'll be breaking down his picks for the best feats for druids. Yeah, druids are really, really good class. They're a full caster, so that's kind of a given. Um, I think druid, in my opinion, has the second best spell list in the game. Uh, right behind wizards. Right behind oh, yeah, our wizards. Yeah. They have and, all the uh, spells. Yeah, and druids actually get a bunch of unique spells to them, too. Yeah. So they actually have a very like, different feel uh than playing a wizard does and they get a bunch of like <laughs> the druid list is probably the only list that has some stuff on it that the wizard list is jealous of so are we talking like control spells summons summons mostly mm -hmm. uh you get really busted summon spells like conjure animals and uh stuff like spike growth um yeah so yeah there's a lot of a lot of really good stuff and of course there's something that the, that the druids are jealous of the wizard stuff like shield but you know hmm. there's nothing a little multi-classing you can't fix but um or druids are selection. heavily reliant to, yeah or feat selection um druids are heavily reliant on concentration for a lot of their spells so we will be looking into that and uh aside from that druids don't really have any weaknesses that need to be buffed up by feats necessarily uh their defense is pretty good um, yeah, there's the whole weird metal armor restriction thing that some tables do abide and some tables don't. Is that even uh, in 5th edition? Or... Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, but it's very weirdly worded. Shall we go over that for just a moment? Because yeah. it could influence your feat selection, I suppose. Uh, there is a line in the Druid's proficiencies, in the, you know, it's listed out on in the PHP, uh, that says Druids won't wear metal armor. Now, it doesn't say the druids are not proficient in metal armor. It says they won't wear it. That is old language. You don't find that language anywhere else in 5th edition. Um, that is something that perhaps you would be more familiar seeing in something like 3rd or 2nd edition. Um, you don't see yeah. stuff like that nowadays, do you? No, not really, but I mean, I kind of get it. It's a, it's like a, a Thematic, choice, yeah. choice forced upon you. Yeah, thematically, I get it, but I wish they would have worded it differently because because of that wording, there's a lot of online debate. Well, like, what happens if a druid does wear metal armor, right? Yeah. And, you know, th there's not really that level of uh, forced characterization that's placed on most D&D characters. Paladin mm -hmm. is the thing that comes closest to that, right? Where you're kind of forced right. into a role. And even then, Paladin is strayed far away from where it used to be. Yeah, a lot more freedom as a paladin than you used to in older. Editions. Oh, I mean, yeah, especially with the you know, certain subclasses. You are... Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the fact that the druid still has that feels like a product of a bygone era. And in the next edition, they are just removing that entirely and saying that druids are proficient in light armor and shields. Ah. So, that at least assuming that the playtest documents, which were which were well received, at least in this regard will stick around until the actual official printing. So that is all to say, just make your medium armor out of like bug chitin or something. I don't know. Okay. Be creative. But a, for that reason. There there are animals with tough hide. There's dragons. Exactly. There's a... That's a really great one. Yeah. I had a druid in my party that I was a DMing a campaign for. I actually had them start out with like stuff that druids would actually legally wear. And then I said, hey, uh, you can make some half plate out of this dragon scale if you want, and you can wear that. And I think that's a really cool way of circumventing it, giving the druid a scaling armor class that gives them a reward for doing anything. Anyway, 
off topic for this video, but that is to say you're not really interested in the armor feats for this character. No. Most likely. So, with that well, being good. said... Freeze up, freeze up some other ones. Yes. Um, with that being said, your first port of call is probably going to be to shore up your concentration, as you are getting good concentration spells right from level one. Um, you're getting Entangle right at level one. That's great. Uh, Fairy Fire is also a great concentration spell right at level one. So uh, grabbing Warcaster right away is uh, a, basically a must, to be honest. Druids don't get uh, Constitution saving throw proficiency inherently. So this is really important because otherwise you're going to be rolling with probably a plus two to make that DC 10 check, which is only about a, like a 60% chance, I think. Which is not enough. Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, it starts off at level one, and it just keeps going all the way through. Your, uh, yep. Your most yep. most of your big banger spells require concentration. Yeah, you, the Reds get a couple good ones. They get Cone of Cold at fifth level. Uh, that's a good blast, and a couple of the subclasses will give good uh, instantaneous spells. But yeah, most well, that's of nice to cast while you've got your cool concentration exactly. spell up. Yeah, exactly. Um, so some a feat that synergizes with a lot of those cool concentration spells that I also recommend you take is telekinetic. Um, okay. Telekinetic gives us a five foot shove that can be used for in conjunction with a couple of different spells. Um, we have uh, Moonbeam is kind of like a diet spirit guardians that isn't centered on yourself. Does a little bit less damage, but it's a second level spell instead of a third, so that's nice. And you can move it. Um, yeah. And uh, it has the exact same uh, wording as Spirit Guardians, where if something enters its space or starts its turn in the Moonbeam space, it takes the damage. So by telekinetically shoving somebody into the Moonbeam, we can trigger the damage, whereas simply moving the Moonbeam onto them would not trigger the damage until the start of their turn. So you're getting okay. double the Moonbeam damage. That's so fine. it's a bit of an yeah, it's a bit of intricate wording there, but uh, aside from that, spike growth, a five foot shove just translates to about five damage on average. Um, so that's great. You know, you could weaponize your bonus action that way. And uh, if you have other people in your party that are also casting control spells or a cleric that's got something like spirit guardians up, then that's all gravy. Um, so town connect also gets a mage hand. Druids don't get mage hand uh, inherently, so that's nice to have as well. Absolutely, that's uh. Yeah, that's that's a really good way for druids to get mage hand. Yeah, and it gives you a plus one to your wisdom. So we we love yeah. everything about telekinetic all the way up to down. So I highly recommend it if you're looking to expand your utility and get a use for your bonus action. Some druid subclasses get a really good use for their bonus action, uh, like wild uh, the wildfire druid. Their bonus action is pretty much locked up every turn. Um, so they may not be interested in this, but for the druids like Land Druid, uh, Wild Shape Druid, uh, Moon Druid, I mean, um, Circle of Dreams, a couple of those, they are looking at, are in the market for a new bonus action option. So this is definitely fits that bill. Yeah, um, this is you can use telekinetic while you're wild shaped, right? Yeah, yeah, you totally can. Okay, yeah, so and a really cool thing with wild shape. Um, and this is a fun combination for all you moon druids out there. You can set down a spike growth, um, turn into a wild shape, then on your next turn, grapple someone as your wild shape, because your wild shape form is probably pretty good at grappling, because it probably has a pretty high strength. And then your wild shape form probably also has a higher speed than you do. So now you can grapple them and drag them around the perimeter of your spike growth. Yeah. And deal a whole bunch of damage to that, and you probably still have another attack that you can make against them as you're grappling them. So, yeah, it's a really good way for a Moon Druid to pump out a lot of damage to a single target. Love it. So, uh, if you're not necessarily in the market for a bonus action option, or if you just want something a bit different, Alert is honestly a feat that I recommend Druids take immediately, as soon as you can get it. Probably Warcaster first, mm. but Alert is perfectly fine to take as your next option, because... Druids are a very unique brand of control caster. They can set up the control spells like a web. Well, actually, druids not, not web, web, which is stupid. Criminal. One of them yes. does. Uh, the 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 one of the land sub subclasses gets web, but anyway. okay. Uh, you can set up you know spells like moonbeam and things like that to do area control, and those are great to cast early in combat as well. Better than those though is summoning spells. 
it is best the best time to cast a summoning spell like conjure animals is immediately <laughs> uh because you get the most use out of it and the it allows you to place the conjured animals or whatever it is you're conjuring exactly where you want it on the field you can create a what i like to call wall of flesh between you and your party right uh, it's very effective because it bites back and uh, it allows you to position the battlefield exactly how you want it, right at the start of combat. You don't have to worry about things getting messy. Your conjured animals are what's going to be taking probably the first attacks before the rest of your party is. It saves your party HP and allows you to continue to fight on for longer. So alert, it, specifically for the druid, is really, really helpful just because of the types of spells they're used to casting. Yeah, and I mean, with a lot of these uh, summons, if you've got... or they get the conjure spells too, right? Yeah, the yeah. They, conjure wood, druids, wood beans and all that. That's uh, yeah, the bus. That's just nuts. Yes. You got forty-seven pixies firing at one dude. You, you know, you might take out a couple of creatures before they ever fire a shot. Yeah. So the other interesting way to look at this is uh, rules as written. All of the conjured creatures roll initiative. Uh, as you summon them. Mm. Now, most tables don't do it like that. No. A lot of tables will say, okay, all of the conjured creatures go on this initiative. You know, initiative right. 8 or something. So, by you going first, your odds of the conjured animals moving soon is actually greater. So, it's you have to think about the initiative order kind of in your head for a second here. So, imagine it as a list. If you're at the top, you cast conjured animals... And those animals come in. You say you rolled a 20 for your initiative. They come in at a 10. Yeah. Okay. There's a bit of room here where some enemies might get to act. But there's also some room here where your conjured animals get to act before the enemies. So say you got rolled instead a 10 initiative. You catch conjured animals. Well, the conjured animals can only go after you. They can't ret retroactively have a turn up here. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So... They're essentially losing 10, 10 slots of initiative that they could possibly be in. Yeah. So by you taking alert, you're on average getting more turns with your conjured animals. Okay, so, well, that's a good point I never considered. Yeah, so it, it you have to kind of visualize that. If I had a piece of paper to write it on, if I was better prepared for this video, maybe that's what I would have done. Why? But, but it really does uh, get the most out of your spells. So I highly recommend all right um where are we going from here exactly where you think we're going <laughs> is it resilient it's time, talk, it's time to talk about resilient again yeah uh, i'll be brief because you know the drill at this point resilient is good because we want to hold our concentration true it's really want yeah. to hold their concentration so say, say for example say you're a um a, a moon druid who their biggest play pattern right is to cast a spell to concentrate on then go into wild shape yeah uh both Warcaster and Resilient will persist into your Wild Shape forms. So your Wild Shape form, even if it doesn't have Constitution saving the proficiency, now it does. Hmm. And it still gets the advantage on the um, on the concentration checks through Warcaster. Which is really good, because without that, a lot of Conjured Animal forms kind of suck at holding... I mean, excuse me, not Conjured Animal. Uh, wild Shape forms kind of suck at holding Concentration. Yeah. Um, even something like a polar bear that you think would have a pretty beefy constitution, it's just a plus three. Well, even if I mean, no matter what it is, you know, if you are a polar bear going to smack people around, it's not like you know, you're hanging back like you know a ranged yeah. rogue or something. You know, you are in the thick of things. You're going to get hit. Yeah. The other thing is a lot of these well shaped forms, even the better ones, have low AC. Um, even something like a giant scorpion, which you think would, you know, pretty good armor, right? I guess AC of like 16. So yeah, it's not that not great. Pretty. Um, the, the elemental forms that you get have a uh, slightly better AC, and they also get damage resistances, which helps a lot in holding your concentration. Uh, but you don't get those till 10th level as a moon druid. Anyway, too much about moon druid. We'll save that for the moon druid video. <laughs> yeah. Which, by the way, of all subclasses, that one... That one definitely needs its own video. Oof. We'll get there. Have no fear. Um, so besides that, at this point, you know, we're talking about feats that you're taking at eighth, twelfth level and beyond. 
you have a lot of freedom at this point. If you want to take something like Fey Touched for uh, Silvery Barbs, Druid is a class that can feel like its first level spell slots are having trouble uh, finding a use in higher tier play. You get Absorb Elements as a good first level reaction, but Absorb Elements doesn't come up in every combat. No. So um, have, being able to grab something like Silvery Barbs is really nice. And Druid is a class that um, does appreciate having an extra Misty Step. Uh, Druid gets Misty Step naturally, I believe. Double check that before I commit to saying that. Yeah, I noticed now that um, you haven't chosen anything that gives us shield. Uh, okay, so that let's talk about that because okay. getting shield through a feat is actually really tough. And also, druids don't get Misty Step, at least not without help of a subclass. Yeah. So that's another reason to take Fate Touch. Um, let's talk about that with shield. So the only good ways to get shield through a feat are uh, Magic Initiate Wizard, or yeah. Sorcerer, I suppose. The sure. problem with that is it only gives you one casting of shield. Mm. Now, one casting of shield is still good, but unlike something like Fey Touched, where we get Silvery Barbs and we can also cast it with our spell slots... Uh, Magic Initiate doesn't let you do that. It only gives you the one casting. So what casting guess silvery, is good? Yeah, Silvery oh, Barbs. Sorry. No, I'm just thinking Silvery Barbs is a good, a pretty decent swap out. I was just thinking Shield, maybe you only need it once if maintaining your concentration is your priority, because then, you know, if you got Warcaster, you got Resilient, maybe maybe only once a day, another attack's going to slip through the cracks and try to break your concentration, and then you want your shield. Yeah, I will say, especially if you're a table that runs only one combat encounter per day, um, then that might actually be a very good consideration for you. I tell so, wait, let me, you know, let me ask you this first. Um, all right. You get attacked, they hit, then you're rolling concentration checks, so you don't actually get to know what the result is before you would do would have used your shield, right? No, 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 no. So what the the order of events here is? Yes. They roll. DM says, "Hey, does a twenty hit?" Yes. You say, "I cast shield." Right. Now your AC is twenty five, whatever. Right. Right. And now you answer, "No, twenty does not hit." You never roll concentration. No, that's what I'm saying, though. If I was I was looking at shield as another means of avoiding concentration. Yes. Or yeah, yeah so yeah. that's not going to work like I thought it was going to. Yeah. So no shield. Yeah, shield does help you protect your concentration in that it helps you not get hit as often. Right. But you know, see what I was thinking is it's okay that you only get it once because you got all this other stuff buffering your uh, your concentration checks, but right. that's not going to work because the yeah. way I was thinking is all right. This failed, then this failed. Ah, oh, but I still got shield. No, I use shield yeah. before any of those checks are rolled. Yeah, no, it, I see the process you were going through there. Yeah, yes. sorry. But in that case, yeah, I, I think I like silvery barbs usable with spell slots better. Yeah, it, it is a bit of a trade off. And like I said, if you only have one combat encounter per day at your table most of the time, mm. it's probably fine to take shield through magic initiate. That's probably okay. Um, I will say druids don't really need to grab Find Familiar through Magic Initiate. They actually have a new feature introduced uh, in Tasha's that allows them to expend the use of Wild Shape to get a familiar. Um, hmm. So druids really aren't in the market for that. If you really want a familiar, you can have it, and you don't need to do anything extra to get it. Um, and you know, druids like you know a land druid or a dreams druid don't really have a lot of use for their Wild Shape anyway, besides scouting. So yeah. it's a good option for them. Um, what else? Oh, one thing, one other thing I, I noticed you didn't pick was a uh, crusher. Yeah, so it that might be something that's more applicable for something like the moon druid because they can specifically take wild shape forms that deal bludgeoning damage. Well, and I was just thinking, uh, with that. yeah, shillelagh. You always got a shillelagh around if you, uh, you if, do, if, if but you, if you're you got your telekinetic. You got your spike growth set up. Bonk him with the shillelagh first. Knock him through five feet. Then telekinetic. Wait, yes. Yeah, because that's an attack. Yeah, Telekinetics yeah. is using a bonus action. Five more feet. Fun times. 
It's two feet to do <laughs> 10 damage. <laughs> two uh, feet well, to do 10 damage. I mean, it's it's fine. If that's something you want to do, that's okay. I just think that an optimal druid isn't going to be swinging their Sulele very often past level five. So, well, I'm specifically for this reason, I might be. Fair enough. But I like bonking people all over the map. Well, we made a we made a build for that. People yes, can go back on the channel, and uh, it's actually I think one of my one of my more viewed builds. Um, and uh, we we had, we and we did do a whole build around Shillelagh. We did take the Crusher feet. Uh, it was okay. mostly a Ranger build. We did take a couple levels in Druid, I think. But anyway, it was it it does what you're no, going to do. No, there was no Druid. You That's we got right. Shillelagh through through uh, Druid initiate. Right. No Druid. Yeah. Uh, Dru Druid Dru warrior. That's right. Yeah, the fighting yeah. style. Yeah, there's a shillelagh build with no druid. Yeah, well, I mean, Maybe. I guess that shows you how much the druid actually needs shillelagh. <laughs> yeah, it's everybody else that needs shillelagh. <laughs> so oh, you know, past, past that, you can take you know the generically good feats, lucky and tough. Um, I should note, and uh, this is again more specifically for moon druid. Tough will not increase the maximum HP of your wild shape forms. Oh. It does not. Because tough gives you the additional temporary, the additional, not temporary, the additional maximum HP when you level up and when you take the feat. Mm -hmm. So technically, I guess if you took the feat while you were in a wild shape form, it would give you maximum HP for that form. And then when you revert it back to your normal form, you wouldn't have the extra maximum HP. So don't do that. <laughs> I don't think any right. DM would I'm not sure I follow you here. Don't worry about it. No DM would actually do that. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm just not sure I follow the whole tough thing with the pit points and the wild shape. All right. Okay. So let's run through the tough feet real quick. Yes. Yes. We get the exact ruling for it here. So your hit point maximum when you take the feet, this all happens yes. exactly when you take the feet. Your hit point maximum increases by an amount equal to twice your level when you gain this feat. So let's say you're level four. Okay. You get a uh, temp. You get a hit point maximum increase of eight to your temp. Your maximum HP. When you wild shape into a new form, you adopt that creature's stat block. Yes, this is okay. not your so, maximum right. HP. This is that creature's maximum HP. And when it, it then further goes on to say, whenever you gain a level thereafter your hit point maximum increases by an additional two hit points. So whatever, you're level 20, you turn into a bear, you're still going to have a bear's nine hit points or whatever. Yes. Okay. Um, not, And I should mention, temporary hit points do not work like this. They would transfer over to your new form. Yes. So okay. if you had 10 temporary hit points and you turn into a bear, the bear has 10 temporary hit points. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, so tough... Um, for most druids, it's probably going to be fine because you're not going to be wild shaping into a form, form most, most of the time. But moon druids may not get the result out of it that they want to. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get to moon druids later. So I was going to ask yep. any specific recommendations for them, but no, we'll save that for the... Yeah, that, the, that's a very complex video. topic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's that. Um. Thank you for sharing, that, uh, and uh, thank you everyone for watching. Let us know what you think down in the comments below. What are your, what are your favorite picks for uh, druid feats? Just straight up generic druid. Let us know in the comments. Like, subscribe. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. -bye.